Hey chillers, it's Tuesday. And you know what that means. I'm Alex. And I'm Amber. And you're listening to another episode of True Crime and Chill. There are so many things that we could be covering right now, dude. Like, it's so many things. Yeah, and there's so many cases we haven't even covered yet. Right? Okay, so we're always looking for suggestions, okay? But we do have a tier on our Patreon that allows us to find cases that might have happened in your hometown. Also, if you ever want to... Also, one thing I wanted to mention to you, there is an app called Crime Door, and you can actually, like, like, walk around crime scenes and stuff. Right? It's so cool. Now, you have to pay for it. It it is. Like, it's $9.99 a month, but, like, you get unlimited access to, like, any crime scene ever. And it's, like, a CGI crime scene that you can, like, walk around and stuff. And it's, like, I found a few cases that we could actually do through that. And that'd be cool. Cool. Uh, For the record, we are not paid by Crime Door. No. endorse this product. No. I think it's just a really cool app. And let me tell you, I stay up way too late at night to sometimes on it. So... (laughs) <laughs> one level of our patreon allows us to get in contact with you to cover a case that happened right in your hometown or as close as we can get because let's face it no town is truly crime free the same <laughs> thing no. no especially not the town we're covering today because despite it being a small community it's definitely got a name for itself because of this case and i would like to thank our patron sarah lee for helping and recommending this case Right, but again, we should probably do a disclaimer first because people seem to like it when we do that, so. Mm, Yes, absolutely. All right, so we are not investigative reporters, detectives, law enforcement, or any sort of professional informants. That's right. We're simply fans of true crime, just like you. We do our best to cover facts that we believe to be the most reliable from our own research online, in books, and through documentaries. If there are any other details that we did not cover, or if there are any inconsistencies with our episodes and the real case, then we apologize to the family and the friends of those affected. Also, if you don't like the way that we present things, there is not a shortage of any of this information out there. It costs zero dollars to be kind, and you can always just click away. That being said, let's get into this week's case. Between 2005 and 2008, eight women were discovered in the bayous of Louisiana. This is the story of the Jeff Davis Eight. Or the Jennings 8. That's right. This case has a few different things it's called, and it refers to a case that summarizes eight murders of eight different women around a four-year period. All of these murders took place in the bayous of Louisiana, and they're all unsolved to this day. Interestingly enough, they're all believed to be kind of tied together in really random ways. Yeah, this this is a weird case. Yeah. So before I get started, I want to say that you all know we typically like to get into each of the individual victims. Our focus is usually on who the victims were and what happened to them. However, in this particular case, there isn't a lot of information on each victim. Plus, there are eight of them. There were a lot of overviews on what happened to them, mostly due to the fact that the majority of the victims were found in such a badly decomposed state that a lot of the authorities didn't really know exactly what happened to them. I will go into as much detail as I can about each of the individual victims, Mostly, I just have a list of their names, and a lot of them were believed to have died in the same way. So I'll go into as much detail as I can find available. Just know I'm not intentionally skipping out any of the details on each of these individual victims. It's either not available or just not known in general. But let's get to it. It starts on May 20th of 2005, when the body of 28-year-old Loretta Lewis was found floating in a local river on the outskirts of Jennings in the Jefferson Davis Parish of southwest Louisiana by a fisherman. Loretta was a mother of two and had been reported missing for three days before she was found. Her body was too decomposed to determine a cause of death. However, the coroner's toxicology report did find that she was, and I quote, extremely intoxicated at the time of her death. She was a known sex worker and had been battling a crack addiction. Her death was seemingly the fallout of the drug trade that ran along the highway I-10 corridor and left areas like South Jennings desolate. Now, Alex, you used to live in Texas, right? Unfortunately. How long did you live there? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. For our Texas people, I love Texas. Hated Colleen. Um, I lived there for two years, I believe. Three years. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, how? what's the drug situation down there? Oh, God. If you live in Killeen, it's terrible. If you live anywhere close to the border, it's even worse. Like, Right. It's bad. all coming in from Mexico, right? Yeah, it's bad. Right. So oftentimes, I-10 that 
runs through Jennings, basically, mm -hmm. uh, is a huge drug trafficking interstate because it comes into to Texas, into Houston, and then from there, they ship it east on I-10. Yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so then less than a month later, on June 18th of 2005, another prostitute, 30-year-old Ernestine Marie Daniels Patterson, was discovered in another canal off the highway of South Jennings. Two men were held for second-degree murder, though the charges were later dropped. She was a native and lifelong resident of Jennings. Her obituary reports that she worked at Iota State School, and she left behind her husband, two sons, two daughters, her parents, three brothers, six sisters, grandmother, and great-grandmother. She had been missing since June 16th. Okay, but did, like, nobody, like, notice she was missing? Well, they, I think they reported her missing on June 16th, and then she was found on June 18th. Okay. Okay. So, basically, like, I don't even, like, have, I honestly don't even have words for this. So, she was, so she was, like, they, like, she had, like, arrests for prostitution and shit and everything. And so, like, they knew she was a prostitute and everything. Mm hmm Was she, like, was she, like, like did police like think that maybe this was just kind of like a John gone wrong or this one, her body was not as decomposed. So it was found that her throat was slit. So they didn't connect the two yet. Okay. So, and it says that like two men were held for her murder, but were later like released. Like, were they just like, were, did they think that they were, th 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 those were the ones who did something or like, did she like, were, she, were they the last people she met with? Like, I really couldn't find more information on it, and I looked. All I found where there were two men held for second-degree murder, but the charges were later dropped. So because the charges were dropped, I don't think their names are listed anywhere. Okay, and so she was found right after... And so she was found after Loretta. Right, like less than a month later. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they were obviously, like, the newer deaths or whatever, if, like... Okay. Well, her, like I said, when she was found, her body was not as decomposed as the other one. So they were able to tell that she died from a slit to the throat. And were they found kind of in the same place or no? They were in separate canals. Okay, but they were still in a canal. Okay. Both of them were. Yes. Okay. All right. I mean, that's, I mean, I would understand why the police may not have made the connection. But at the same time, like if you got two prostitutes who are found in canals that's that's with their throat slit like that's pretty distinctive like calling card right there like that that's pretty distinctive sure but like i said the first body was so decomposed that they couldn't tell how she died yeah true so very true but i mean um, like that's still like pretty distinctive though um on march 18th 2007 a third victim with a similar profile to the others 21 year old Kristen gary lopez was found in yet another canal Kristen was last seen alive by friends and family on March 6th of 2007. By all published accounts, Kristen was involved in a high-risk lifestyle of drugs and prostitution. Because it was not unusual to not hear from her for periods of time, she was not reported missing until 10 days later. And then, on March 18th, a fisherman discovered Lopez's completely nude body in the Petagene Canal, a rural area near Cherokee Road right off Louisiana 99 about 10 miles south of the town of Welsh. Investigators felt her body had been placed in that location, but killed elsewhere. According to autopsy results, the cause of death for Kristen Gary Lopez is undetermined. Toxicology results showed elevated levels of drugs and alcohol in her system. Two months later, in May of 2007, Frankie Richard and his niece, Hannah Connor, were arrested in connection with her death. There were they were also questioned about the deaths prior to hers, the other two. So they were starting to make connections. Okay. Uh, Frankie Richard was reportedly seen with all three of the victims in the last days of their lives. Charges were eventually dropped due to insufficient evidence and conflicting witness statements. Also arrested in May 2007 was Tracy L. Chasson. She was booked an accessory after the fact charges. Tracy was apparently the person who reported Kristen missing. Investigators believe she knew where the body was when she made the report. Like Richard and Connor, charges were dropped against Tracy Chasson due to lack of evidence and conflicting statements. According to Jeff Davis Parish District Attorney Michael Cassidy, the Lopez case also lacked physical evidence and was supported by the statement of one witness. 
The district attorney said the investigation fell apart after that witness changed her story, not once, but four times. He said, and I quote, her credibility, I'm not going to say diminished, it was gone. Okay, so first off, the guy who was seen with all three people before their deaths. Mm -hmm. Okay, that right there should have been like more than enough to keep looking into that. Like, I understand if they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him right then and there. But if he was the last person to see all three people before they died, like that's a huge red flag right there. Mm -hmm. And like, again, another nude body. Like, it's quite interesting that all three of these all three of these women were prostitutes and were seen with this guy and all of a sudden now all three of them are dead and it's like okay well that's weird that's suspicious well but the one the third body was found in 2007 and the first two were found in 2005 okay but still oh i'm not saying they're not connected and it's not suspect especially when the same guy was seen with these women days up to their death and like the fact that like they re- they like arrested this other girl for knowing where Kristen was when she actually made the report that she was missing. Like right. you don't like I don't know. It's just like I understand like a witness like changing their stories and stuff like that, but at the same time it's like I'm sitting here wondering Okay, so what is being hidden right now? Right. So around 7.30 in the morning on May 12th of 2007, a couple discovered another nude female body. This one was lying in a roadway near the intersection of Bobby Road and Earl Dunnan Road. It's a rural area about three miles southeast of Jennings between Louisiana 102 and US 90. Although not a heavily traveled area, it is used daily, apparently, by farmers and residents. This was the next victim, and she was 26-year-old Whitney Dubois. She had been missing since May 10th. So again, two days after she went missing, her body turns up. Whitney, had But she wasn't... Been, um, what's the word for it? She wasn't decomposed like the others. We're going to get there. Like, okay. Uh, Whitney had not been seen by her family for a couple of days prior to May 12th of 2007, but they did not report her missing. Tragically, Whitney left behind a five-year-old daughter. Whitney was last seen in the middle of the night at Frankie Richards' house on McKinley Street in Jennings. It was claimed that she was only there briefly and left the residence on foot. Shortly before going to Richards' house, Whitney had spent about an hour at her grandmother's house on Gallup Street, which is one street over from McKinley. At the time, the sheriff's office had no missing persons report filed with their office. She was identified through fingerprint records on file from prior drug and forgery charges. The cause of her death has not been publicly released. There were no visible signs on the body indicating the manner of death. Toxicology reports indicated, get this, high levels of drug and alcohol in her body. Jeff Davis Parish Sheriff Ricky Edwards believed Whitney may have been dead for several days before her body was placed where it was found and that she did not die at that location. He also publicly stated that her death might be connected to the three deaths prior to hers and that he had a serial dumper on his hands, although he had no evidence that it was the same person. Her body was not as decomposed as the first three, giving authorities hope that valuable evidence could be collected. Were they? (laughs) I'm going to guess not, since there are only two of the eight that they know for sure, including the next one. Uh, 23-year-old Laconia Chantel Muggy Brown. She was last seen on May 27th of 2008, around 2 a.m. on the morning of May 29th. A Jennings police officer discovered her body lying on Rocka Road, which leads to the police firing range. Laconia's body was the first found within the city limits of Jennings. She was clothed, but had no shoes on. Her throat had been slit and her body had been doused with bleach. She was wearing a white tank top style shirt that had been stained from white to pink. Police believe the stain to be blood and that some kind of liquid had been diluted from red to pink. Possibly the bleach. They had been able to discover more evidence and leads with this case than any of the previous deaths since her body was found about six hours after it was left on the road. Laconia's family stated that she may have known something horrible was about to happen to her and that she had been living in fear just days prior to her death. Laconia was at one time implicated in a rape case, along with the second victim, Ernestine Patterson. 
So first off, did this woman have like, I guess I would say like mental illness? Not like, that did you I find anything found. That? Okay. Because like like that, I said, informa the information I shared is like the only information about, I could find. Okay. Well, because the, the only reason I asked that is because like you said something like, well, she said that she may have known something terrible was about to happen to her and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it's like usually that kind of only comes from one of two things. One, if you have a mental illness and your brain is making you think that. Or Paranormal. two, if you've actually done something. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm in trouble. Like this is, I'm in trouble and stuff. And if she was impl implicated in a rape case, then like if these two were implicated in a rape case, and that would be one thing because it may have been like the victim of the, of the, it may be in like the victim or the family of the victim or whatever. Um, like it, like, you know what I mean? Sure. Like it could have been one of them coming back and getting revenge. However, however, it would be understandable if they weren't found the exact same way as the other victims that didn't have anything to do with that. Right. So I'm going to get to it, but there are other ways that these victims are all connected. All of them. And it's CV. So um, let's get into the sixth victim. And she was discovered on September 11th of 2008, around three in the afternoon. Hunters came across the body of 24-year-old Crystal Shea Zeno on a levee in a wooded area near a dry irrigation canal just south of Jennings. The area is located on Lacour Road, just off Louisiana Route 1126, a couple of miles southeast of Jennings. She had been missing since August 29th, and she was last seen at the Sonic Drive-In in Lake Arthur, Louisiana. Shea oh, had been an employee at that Sonic until May of 2008, at which time she began living in Jennings. She reportedly liked to fish, sing, and enjoyed listening to music. She was married with a daughter, and her first husband preceded her in death. She was a people person and enjoyed spending time with her family and friends. Her body was badly decomposed, indicating that she had been there for quite some time. It took nearly two months to identify the body. Her death was ruled as a homicide, although the cause of death and toxicology reports have not been released to the public. Shay also knew many of the other victims. Okay, so obviously all these victims knew each other probably because of the prostitution aspect. Part of it, yep. Because, like, that that would be a huge, like, that would be a huge thing because obviously prostitution, like, not, like uh, that's a very close-knit community. Like, if you, if you were a sex worker... It, it like sex worker in general doesn't matter whether you are an escort doesn't matter whether you are a stripper it doesn't matter whether you do only fans it doesn't matter like it is a very close-knit tight like small community and i know because i have a few friends in those com in that community right. by the way i'm very like i don't care what you do as long as you're safe about it like right agree get checked screen your guys i don't give a crap be you be safe do what you need to do yeah but because of that because it is a very small community like you're they're going to know each other even if somebody isn't doing that anymore. So that doesn't surprise me that she knew many of the other victims. Right. Well, but and then here's where this here's where this comes in. If she knew many of the other victims and there you go, there's a huge like red flag right there then who who was last seen with almost all of these victims before they died? There's more. Again, this case gets weird like spider web weird. Okay? This was a rabbit hole. I did not have enough time to talk about everything. Yeah, so, and the fact that she was already so decomposed, like heavily decomposed, after just like a week and a half, like it was like it was basically almost two weeks worth of that like, she was missing, and she was already heavily decomposed. Yep, like that's that's kind of making me wonder. Right. So let's get into the next victim because this one actually she was known to run around with pretty much all of the other victims. Seventeen-year-old uh, Brittany Gary was the seventh and youngest victim. On November 2nd of 2008, Brittany walked out of the family dollar store in Jennings, never to be seen alive again. Sometime after 5.30 that day, she it's supposed that she was abducted. And 13, and I quote, agonizing days passed as her family and a concerned public held out hope that she was safe and might be located soon. But on November 15th of 2008, her deceased body was found in a grassy area outside of Jennings. Brittany... Uh, reportedly loved to swim, hang out with her friends, and listen to music. 
She enjoyed spending time with her friends and family, and she was a friendly and loving person who is missed by many. It wasn't until Brittany's mom, who has been described as a force of nature, pushed and pushed for answers that something started to be done in this seemingly random string of murders. And in December of 2008, Jefferson Davis Parish Sheriff Ricky Edwards announced the formation of a task force called from local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies to investigate the murders. While reassuring to some, the beefed-up scrutiny wasn't enough to prevent an eighth death. On August 19th of 2009, 26-year-old Nicole Jean Guillory was spotted off I-10 in nearby Acadia Parish. She was a resident of Lake Arthur and had four beautiful children. Four kids. She enjoyed listening to music and loved being outdoors. I'm noticing these two things. Music and outdoors are a big thing with some of these victims. Uh, mm-hmm. She had been missing since August 16th, so three days uh, after she was found. And she was also to, known to be friends, like I said, with many of the victims. And she was the cousin of Kristen. So this person killed two people from two different families. Mm-hmm. Fun. Yeah. And, like, they people didn't start, like... I mean, I don't know. Like, we see... <sighs> We see this a lot with a lot of cases, like Mm -hmm. where it is sex workers and stuff and they don't necessarily take Take it seriously. Yeah, they don't. They really don't take this seriously. Like they don't because it's like, oh, well, you guys are sex workers. So you guys put yourself in that situation. And it's like, no, no, that's not how we're going to do this. Like, I'm sorry, but no, like. Girl, I'm going to tell you, this is about to get weirder. Oh, I bet. I bet. (laughs) Because because whenever it involves. (laughs) Whenever it whenever it involves sex workers and police, it always gets weird because yeah. (laughs) So so that fall, Sheriff Edwards publicly acknowledged for the first time that the deaths were possibly the work of a common offender, and the task force more than doubled the reward. Yeah, Uh, yeah. they more than doubled the reward for information leading to the killer of what became known as the Jeff Davis Eight. An investigation of the Jeff Davis 8 led a journalist to believe the killings were actually a police cover-up. Meanwhile, that story began to attract national attention. And in January of 2010, the New York Times printed an article, which we have linked on our website, truecrimeandchill.com. And they reported on the fear and frustration felt by family members of the women that were killed, as well as the... um, lack of of uh, investigation of local law enforcement in charge of solving these crimes and in one instance the times noted that the chief investigator bought a pickup truck from an inmate known to be friends with one of the victims and a witness later said that she saw the third victim in the truck on the day of her disappearance But by the time it was reported, the vehicle had already been washed and resold. The the investigator was fined and removed from the case and placed in charge of evidence at the parish sheriff's office. So wait, they took this lead investigator off the the case and then put him in charge of evidence Mm, to potentially be able to destroy any kind of evidence that would have... Yeah, yeah, it seems shady to me too. The New York Times article caught the attention of New Orleans-based writer Ethan Brown, who ventured to Jennings to conduct his own investigation in the middle of 2011. Through lots of interviews with families and suspects and task force personnel, and also scanning the public records, Ethan Brown uncovered evidence that pointed him away from the serial killer theory and toward a more complex cover-up orchestrated by authorities theory Uh, on the article platform medium we he created an article that is linked on also on truecrimechill.com and he shared that the victims not only knew each other well and shared similar problems with their drug addictions and financial problems and prostitution but they also all served as police informants according to relatives many seemed excessively anxious or frightened before they would be too. Yeah. Well, but that's the thing. All of them were worried about their well-being before they disappeared. Well, gee, I wonder why. Right. 
The article made it clear that they couldn't rely on protection from the police, even though that's something they're supposed to provide their informants. So in December of 2007, two inmates told Jennings Sergeant Jesse Ewing on tape that they knew about the truck from the Lopez case being sold to the investigator and scrubbed clean of evidence. Suspicious of his co-workers, Ewing sent the tapes to a regional FBI office, only for them to be relayed to supervisors on the task force. Soon afterward, well, he was out of a job. And, oh. even more, yeah, and even more surprising, one member of the sheriff's office, David Barry, was pointed as a murder suspect by multiple witnesses. Oh! One of them even described how Barry would cruise the seedy south side for prostitutes with his wife. Then they would drug the pickup with a spiked drink and bring her home to their sex room. Despite the numerous allegations, he only sat with one interview with the task force before he died in 2010. If you can't see my... What the fuck is wrong with this police department? Oh. <gasps> Don't get me wrong. Okay, do not get me wrong. I am fully for, like, you do, you know, we still need police officers. I do believe that there are good police officers out there. Like, I really feel like we need to reform the police system. But this just... This makes me understand why ACAB is a thing. Yeah. Like, this th this story right here, and I know I'm probably going to get a lot of heat from it, and I really don't care at this point. Like, this this is, like, because if you look at all the cases that we cover with prostitutes or with sex workers or anything like that, mm -hmm. it's always one of three things. Somebody was out there killing them, and nobody cared. Like, the police, the police force basically was just like, eh, whatever, they're not really all that important. Mm -hmm. Um. It was, it wasn't a, ra I mean, it was a random thing. It just had a lot of coincidences, but they still didn't want to investigate or the police were actually in on it and doing it themselves. Right. Right. Well, just like when we covered, say, for example, Ketty, right? Yeah. Like, there's no way, like, that investigation was botched and there's no, no way it wasn't on way. purpose. No freaking way. Yeah. Right. No freaking, I. I can't. I can't even. I cannot even. <laughs> I cannot even. Like, I am just... I... How did he die? Here's my question. How did he die? Yeah, I'm really not sure. I couldn't find any information around it. Like, I searched. Did he, like, did he just, like, kill over? Did I, I don't know. Back? Did his wife I... kill him? Like... However... We do need to revert back to Frankie Richard, the pimp and former strip club proprietor who was also allegedly an informant and claimed to have been sexually involved with most of the women. This is also the man that was seen with most of the victims shortly before they died. Despite his uh, lengthy rap sheet and the allegations that placed him in connection to some of the murders, he was free to walk the streets and talk however much he wanted to, with the writer, Ethan Brown, about his involvement with all of the victims. Okay. However, Frankie Richard died on March 22nd of 2020. Of course he did. Of course he did. Of yeah. course he did. Yeah. So unfortunately, there is information that we may never know. However, Ethan Brown was able to generate enough buzz with his article, and fortunately for him, True Detective debuted with the first season creating a storyline of murder investigations in Backwater, Louisiana. It was enough to land him a book deal. He also generated pushback from the Jefferson Davis Parish Law Enforcement with new Sheriff Ivy Woods uh, pointing him out as a, quote, author of fiction stories. So she basically discredited everything that he wrote in that book then. Well, he was working on the book, and before he published it, they were trying to say, oh, he writes fiction stories. I, I, so the media lies, basically. So she was basically trying to be like, 
oh yeah, totally not true. Like right. he's writing fiction stories. Yeah, well, there's a lot of fucking shit for it to be a fiction story, man. Well, and we've heard that whole media lies thing before. It's what Jim Jones used to. Oh yeah. So what's worse is the suspicious links that had killed the eight women and silenced the witnesses. They were threatening, apparently, to come for him next. After one of his contacts told him that he'd, quote, heard more than once that you'll never get that book out. You can take that however you want to, end quote. Ethan was a little worried to join, to return to Jennings and complete his interviews for months after that. I would be too, like, damn. However, he managed to finish his work. In September of 2016, he released... Murder in the Bayou, who killed the women known as the Jeff Davis Eight. And it flushed out the reporting featured in his Medium article, and it delivered some new information. A field representative for Louisiana Congressman Charles, I'm going to, I'm going to botch this. I'm going to be upfront and honest. Charles Bustani owned a notoriously seedy Jennings Hotel where the congressman had allegedly had sex with three of the victims. And, of course, this information came out right during a tense battle for a Senate seat. So the congressman filed a defamation lawsuit against Ethan Brown and his publisher. But the lawsuit was dropped in December after he lost the race. And uh, what I do appreciate, though, is that Ethan Brown believes that the victims deserve real justice. And beyond the backlash of those named in its pages... Murder in the Bayou is praised as a great advocation for finding answers. Good. Yeah. Like, that's good. Like, honestly, like, and I'm, I'm, like, let's be real here. I have a stack of true crime books, like, (laughs) deep that I need to read and everything, like, deep that I need to read and stuff. And some of them are about cases that we've already done. Some of them are about cases that we're going to do and stuff. But, like, this one's I'm adding to it. But, like, this is just, like... This is just, it's a huge thing because it'd be, it'd be one thing if like maybe one of them was a police informant, but the fact that all of them were police informants yep, and all of them died and curiously the same and, cu- and like curiously the same manner and all of them were found in the same place. And then you have all the deco- decomposition ish. like ish, but like they were found near water in or near water. The, the one to me that really got me about David Barry and his wife going yeah, to try and pick a prostitute and then and then they would drug the woman they picked up with a spiked drink and, and all most the of these women well but most of these women were found extremely intoxicated and drugged yeah to me that's that's weird and totally too relatable for my taste right like you're just kind of like sitting here like hmm okay yeah we see you right but then, of course, you have the pimp, and it's hard not to sort of, you know, point fingers at that guy. Yeah, exactly. It's so, just, it's the point now where I'm like, okay, well. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm Obviously, you guys are covering something up. You don't really want to, you don't really want to say anything about it, which I get. But at the same time, it's like, well, why are you guys hiding this so much? It kind of reminds me of, like, the Matrice Richardson case. Because, mm. like, you know, if you guys weren't hiding something, then why aren't you being more helpful? Right. Right. Um, this case is still unsolved. I highly recommend picking up Ethan Brown's book, Murder in the Bayou, Who Killed the Women Known as the Jeff Davis Eight. We will have further... a link to it on our, on our, on our page, truecrimeandchill.com, too. Yes. So. Uh, it's a further dive into this sad story. The victims were real people who left behind families, husbands, children, parents. If you have information about this case, there is an $85,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the subjects, potentially subjects, responsible for these murders. If you have any information that you think may be helpful to the investigation, please contact the multi-agency investigative team hotline at area code 337-824-6662, your local FBI office, or the nearest American embassy or consulate. Thank you for listening to True Crime and Chill. For more information, including case notes, photos, and sources, please visit our website at truecrimeandchill.com. You can also stay connected with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. 
Look for new episodes from us each week on Tuesday.